Um, I'll be speaking to you today on the preservation of evidence. I wanted to start with uh, an explanation of why preservation is important. Um, unlike um, a lot of investigations, uh, investigations in medical malpractice cases usually begin uh, long after the care at issue ended. And therefore, when you are on notice of litigation, it's important that you have preserved evidence that will allow you to recreate your care and to show the jury uh, why uh, you did what you did and why your care was reasonable, appropriate, and compassionate under the circumstances. The duty to preserve is triggered by notice of potential litigation. In that regard, it may be informal, uh, such as a statement by a patient or a letter, or it could be a formal uh, trigger, meaning uh, service of a summons and complaint. But once uh, you uh, have notice of the litigation, you have a duty uh, to preserve evidence, and you should begin by um, identifying the information you may have that must be preserved. That could be an electronic file, a paper chart, uh, emails, uh, audit trails, etc. And it's also important to identify where the information is. Is the information on your server? Is it on a laptop, uh, a paper chart, or an email exchange, etc.? And just to give you an example, I recently had a case um, where the medical chart, of course, was saved, but then a physician told me that he had sent himself an email uh, a few days after treating the patient to remind him of what happened, and he sent that before any litigation. But, um, of course, that was something that had to be disclosed. So it is important that you identify um, where that information is. And the next step is uh, to notify uh, that are uh, below board. Uh, so with regard to the information, um, you must make sure that there's a legal hold on that information. You must make sure that the information um, is sequestered. You should try to deny access to it. You should prevent the routine destruction of it and make sure that it is indefinitely uh, maintained as is. And that is because as time goes on, uh, if litigation indeed ensues, uh, there is a rule in Arizona which requires the disclosure of information. And I should tell you that in the, in the old days and, and in some other states, um, there wasn't a duty to disclose. Rather, you relied on the lawyer uh, to ask a question of the opposing party. And if the lawyer wasn't smart enough to think of the question, you never had to disclose it. But Arizona uh, was considered by many to be a forward-looking state and decided that in the interests of uh, reducing legal costs and making sure that, uh, that the court's truth-seeking function uh, is maintained, that it would be better to disclose information. The information um, that you have to disclose through your attorney under 26.1 includes both documents and electronically stored information. And with regard to electronic medical records, um, you should know it's not just what you might see on the screen uh, when you look on a computer monitor or on a laptop or an iPad or whatever you use. It also might be the metadata that is requested. The metadata, of course, is information that tracks um, who accessed the chart, what changes they made to the chart, and uh, basically allows you to see activity with relation to the electronic medical record. For example, um, I can tell you in a case uh, that I'm involved in, um, I was asked to produce uh, the audit trail software or identify it, and also to identify um, the uh, software in the process, <clears throat> excuse me, by which uh, the chart was protected from loss or destruction. So um, it does go beyond just producing what's visible on the screen. Also, um, when you're thinking about this, I'm sure you're asking yourself, uh, what if um, inadvertently or actually through the routine process of uh, file management, some information was lost? 
And there's actually a rule that addresses that, and that rule states that absent exceptional circumstances, <clears throat> excuse me, a court may not impose sanctions under the rules for failing to provide electronically stored information that is lost as a result of routine good faith operation of the system. So uh, with respect to that particular rule, it provides you with a safe harbor, assuming that something was inadvertently lost because of a routine uh, maybe file destruction process or um, if for some reason uh, disks were written over through uh, time. But keep in mind that that rule primarily would apply uh, when you are not on notice of litigation. Once you're on notice of litigation, you should absolutely uh, stop any routine process of destroying information so as to prevent um, any accusation that you did not keep uh, evidence that's necessary. <clears throat> and to kind of to summarize this preservation idea in terms of keeping the information that you have, um, during uh, cases that involve medical malpractice, a great deal of time can be wasted and defenses can be hurt if the entire uh, medical record is not kept and produced. And that's because litigants, meaning the defendant doctor, the defendant doctor's lawyer, and experts who are involved in the case are trying to recreate events. And sometimes, if there's a key piece of information missing, it can actually lead uh, everyone down the wrong path. And if it happens to be a path that hurts the defense, it can be troublesome. So look at your chart and your records as something to aid you in your defense of the case and to show that you acted reasonably. Now, I want to uh, talk about another um, angle or another um, category of preservation of evidence. When a lawsuit uh, is filed and MICA, for example, assigns counsel, there's a letter that goes out to the insured that talks about not making modifications or alterations or additions to the medical records. And it says any changes will harm the defense of the case. Um, that statement is very important. Almost always uh, the chart or the care can be defended, but in those unfortunate instances where, where changes have been made uh, after the fact where they shouldn't have been made, it makes it difficult, if not impossible, to defend the case. It can also take a case that um, has no worth and uh, by virtue of the changes um, cause payments to have to be made. Now in the court system uh, this is called spoliation and that is defined as the destruction, mutilation, alteration, or concealment of evidence. And um, the concept uh, that lies underneath this doctrine of course is that for the judicial system to function fairly one party in a case cannot be permitted to gain an unfair advantage through the destruction of evidence. Uh, with respect to um, the practical effect of an accusation of spoliation, um, if uh, a party can prove that occurred, a presumption arises that the destroyed evidence was unfavorable to the party responsible for preserving it. And of course, um, that probably makes intuitive sense to you in that uh, if you had a piece of evidence and uh, the allegation was that you deliberately destroyed it, um, it raises the, the notion that you wouldn't have done so if it was helpful to you. As a result of this doctrine, um, Arizona has a remedy uh, for the failure to preserve evidence and it's an instruction to the jury that it can draw a negative inference against the party who failed to preserve the evidence. Now, um, I want to talk to you about a couple of cases that have addressed spoliation uh, because I suspect that some of you might be concerned that you would be unfairly accused or could be unfairly accused of that when in fact your actions were fairly innocent. So, um, 
courts uh, in Arizona do look at um, the issue of whether the destruction was innocent, whether it was negligent, or whether it was intentional. It's a case-by-case -case analysis. And as um, is probably obvious to you, an innocent um, loss of evidence or destruction of evidence uh, would not be viewed um, uh, poorly by the court when compared to an, an intentional loss. Also, the courts look at the prejudice that might be caused to uh, one party vis-a-vis uh, -vis the loss of the evidence. And if, for example, whatever the evidence was, um, uh, whatever the evidence showed can be recreated through other means, it's less prejudicial than if this was the only ev evidence. And I want to give you a couple uh, examples of that, a couple of cases that went up on appeal in the state of Arizona, one medical, one not. Um, in terms of the, the medical case, it was a case called Smizer. It involved a man who had a severe asthma attack. As a result, the uh, 911 was called, an ambulance arrived to take him to the hospital. And the question in the case was whether the CPR was done uh, appropriately, whether the uh, attempts to save his life were within the standard of care. There were some cardiac monitoring strips in that case uh, that were not preserved. The appellate court actually found in that case that the loss of the strips was not that significant um, for a number of reasons. One reason was that um, there was no evidence that they were nefariously destroyed or lost. In fact, there was little evidence on uh, where the strips went. Um, second, though, they relied on an emergency medicine uh, physician who was actually involved in the case and said the strips weren't that important in terms of uh, decision-making uh, with regard to the CPR and resuscitation. Uh, so they actually found in that case that um, the failure to preserve the strips was not a very significant um, deal. Um, while that does give you uh, an idea uh, of the kind of analysis that can be done and the fact the analysis can turn uh, in favor of the defendant, um, again, I emphasize it's a case-by-case -case evaluation. Another case, uh, on the other hand, that went up on appeal, the court took a more dim view of what happened. This was not a medical case, but it will give you an idea of the principles involved. It's called McMurtry. It was a woman in Flagstaff who went to a hotel, and the allegation was she was served too much alcohol. She went up to a room and stepped onto a balcony and fell to her death. Well, there was videotape of her, uh, both... Um, in the portion of the hotel where she was drinking, or at least where she was ingressing and egressing from the area where she was drinking. And there's also video, uh, unfortunately, of the fall. Well, the hotel said we didn't save the video um, that might have shown whether she was intoxicated because we thought the police had it. The court, though, um, frowned upon that. And the reason it frowned upon that, ex that explanation was because of the duty uh, to preserve evidence if you're on notice of litigation. And you might recall a few moments, uh, moments ago I was talking about that. Because the hotel was on notice that litigation might ensue because of this death, they were required to keep that um, particular videotape. And of course it would have been central uh, to the issue of whether she was served too much alcohol or not. Um, so that's uh, a couple of different examples, one that uh, went the, in favor of the defendant and one that went, uh, or at least seemed to go in the direction of the plaintiff. Um, now, uh, with regard to some medical cases that I've been involved in that can give you some ideas, though, about the uh, practical impact. Uh, one case involves a patient who died after attempted lap band surgery. The issue? Did she die of a myocardial infarction from pre-existing heart disease or blood loss? The missing records, cardiac monitoring strips from the ICU, which were reviewed after the patient had died. And now there's an allegation of spoliation with respect to those strips. And as a practical matter, I should tell you, in all the depositions that are taken, doctors are asked, what do you remember about seeing on the strips? The nurses are asked the same thing, and unfortunately without them, uh, you might imagine, um, it's sometimes difficult to recreate what those strips showed one way or another. Um, 
Another example, uh, a physician is sued. Uh, this is not an Arizona case, but a physician is sued. Um, he alters the chart to show the patient was improving, not worsening. The original chart is destroyed. Lo and behold, the patient had a copy of the original chart uh, from another provider that was obtained before litigation commenced, and it showed uh, alterations. And um, uh, one more example. Uh, this is uh, just to give you an idea of the parameters, and this actually had to do with a, a doctor's uh, allegedly with the doctor's office staff, and it had to do with a signature on a consent for surgi surgery. It was a very defensible case, uh, but the signature on the consent was identical to a signature on another consent, and although typically I think we uh, suspect forgery when two um, handwriting samples or signatures are different, um, in this case the principle was that because no two signatures are exactly alike, um, there could not have been uh, anything other than a forgery. At least that was the allegation. Just to give you an illustration, here uh, you see my name uh, on the portions of uh, the signature line for two different documents. Um, you might at first glance think, okay, so Patrick signed it twice. Um, that's how he writes his name, no big deal. But um, uh, the way this is done is that, as you can see on this next slide, uh, the name is uh, cut from a copy of an original signature and pasted onto a new document. That case, unfortunately, had to be settled. Now, I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, electronic medical records, and this dovetails back into the uh, metadata issue. So in this particular case, the issue is uh, a nurse writing that she contacted a physician uh, to talk about a patient at 21.45 p.m., and she said that she uh, made that entry contemporaneously. But when we looked at the additional data available, you find that it actually was, the note was actually entered at 4 in the morning, and it was uh, not designated a late entry. And in addition to that, um, it was after some um, adverse events that occurred with respect to the patient. Now, uh, spoliation does not just apply to defendants. It also applies to plaintiffs. Plaintiffs have a duty to maintain records. Uh, in one case, uh, there was an expert that was hired by a lawyer for a plaintiff, and that expert had some records uh, concerning the defendant physician's treatment of another patient. That expert did not keep those records, and there was an allegation against the plaintiff that there was spoliation because uh, the argument goes, uh, presumably the expert would have kept the records um, unless they were unfavorable. Another one, and this is a pretty dramatic illustration, plaintiff's uh, expert, meaning the patient's expert, is given a tissue slide in a case involving the question of a pathology diagnosis. Uh, the, the expert in California loses the slide. I think the case went to trial, and although I wasn't involved, I think it was a defense verdict. But again, that'd be a case where the argument was that plaintiff uh, failed to keep um, the information or the tissue specimen necessary. So to summarize, um, it is important to your defense that you have all of the medical records and information, um, if you are sued, available that can be produced to the defendant, or I'm sorry, that can be produced to the plaintiff. It is important for your defense in showing your compliance with the standard of care. And I've told you some examples so that you are aware that this um, issue has arisen in litigation and sometimes arises unfairly. So uh, the uh, key uh, message is to, uh, once you're aware of the litigation, to take steps to make sure that the medical record and other information is locked down, um, not accessed other than for the legal case, and that it's preserved indefinitely. And if you do that, um, it will definitely assist your defense. Um, now, the, the second topic that I have uh, to present to you today is assisting your lawyer in preparation for a trial. Um, 
I should start with um, telling by telling you that actually the preparation for trial begins, uh, believe it or not, at the time of the initial meeting with your lawyer when you first get notice of the litigation. And hopefully um, you won't ever go through this, but for those of you that, that unfortunately might, um, once the case um, has been filed, preparation begins. Now, that's not to say that it's a quick road to trial. It takes a year or two years. But what happens is the lawyer initially meets with you and reviews your records and talks to you about what you did and why your care was within the standard of care. Then experts are hired on your behalf, one on standard of care and one on causation. Uh, the lawyer typically does that, but you can assist in that process to make sure the person hired um, is someone that you uh, have trust in, even if you don't know that person, and someone who can articulate um, their analysis of the case uh, and why your actions were within the standard of care. You'll also be deposed and in preparation for the deposition there'll be more meetings and it will be important for you to work with your lawyer to recreate um, the work you did for the patient and why you treated that patient um, as you should have under the standard of care, your thought process behind that treatment and um, hopefully express that the treatment you provided showed your compassion, uh, concern, and professionalism for that patient. During that preparation phase, the pretrial phase, um, there will also be an opportunity to look at literature. Literature is often a mixed bag. If there is literature uh, that supports the case, uh, that's a plus. If there is not uh, literature uh, that supports the case, that's not necessarily a minus. You also will want to think as trial approaches about um, your role as a teacher in the trial. In that regard, you'll um, be asked to identify demonstrative exhibits, uh, models, diagrams to help you explain to the jury uh, the medicine and help you explain to the jury why your treatment was reasonable. And I I want to emphasize your role as a teacher in the case because um, you would be amazed at um, how important it is uh, for those doctors who unfortunately have to go to trial uh, to uh, show that they are good teachers. It demonstrates um, your intelligence, meaning your understanding of the issues. It demonstrates the complexity of the medicine, which people often don't understand, is far more complex than what they might see in uh, mainstream media like TV or books. And it also helps you um, sometimes uh, forget about the uh, anxiety-ridden circumstance you're in. Um, I've seen physicians who, once they begin teaching, you can sort of see the uh, the tremendous stress uh, be forgotten for a moment and then they're just a physician uh, speaking uh, to another person about their life's work. Um, also uh, in preparation for trial it will be important for you to review depositions of your experts uh, including the ones adverse to you and to know your own deposition because your testimony will be so very important and you don't want to contradict it at trial. You also have to know the key uh, medical records and be well versed in them. Believe it or not, um, over the course of a one or two year litigation process, physicians experience litigation fatigue. It becomes harder to look at the records both from an emotional perspective and it also becomes um, uh, tiresome to uh, continuously take time away from their work to look at them, but as trial approaches you'll have to revamp and know the medical records. You might also be surprised to know that, um, believe it or not, even after a record's been looked at 10 or 20 times at trial, a doctor will look at a particular notation and suddenly the light bulb will go off and he or she will um, mention that um, that is actually significant for a reason that had not been um, previously emphasized. 
Um, you will also, um, as trial as the as trial is imminent, you will of course have to um, uh, fortify yourself mentally and, and physically. Uh, it actually is a trying uh, process uh, for you, and you'll have to to steel yourself mentally and physically to go through it because during that trial you're under attack, and of course um, that's not a position. Uh, that our that human nature is uh, designed to be under for long periods of time. Um, so keep that in mind. And I'm I'm reaching the end of this uh, presentation, but I wanted to I think uh, do something important, and that's again go back to your actual testimony during the trial. It's it's so very important uh, that the jury is able to see who you really are as opposed to simply see uh, this person who's under the microscope at trial. So you'll need to be um, prepared to be thoughtful, be composed, be calm, be direct in your answers to questions asked of you, and to hopefully um, allow the jury to see the kind, caring, and compassionate doctor who took care of this patient who had an unfortunate outcome. Um, so, with that in mind, we will now go to questions uh, and comments, and I think we've, uh, Julie will take the lead on this. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, again, Mr. White has agreed to stay a few extra minutes to answer any questions, so please feel free to submit those at this time. We do have a couple in the queue that I want to go over. Um, the first is what if any consequences would occur if our practice has unintentionally lost destroyed relevant patient records I think you kind of went over this but go ahead yes I think that um, was uh, reviewed with respect to rule 37 G um, if it's uh, an unintentional loss and the destruction is pursuant to a routine um, activity and you had no notice of the litigation you'll find some protection there but even if not under rule 37 um, you also of course have an opportunity to explain why uh, the unintentional destruction happened and to show that it was an innocent um, uh, occurrence and that it did not prejudice the other side so all is not lost great Okay, the next question, it says, I'm not sure if this is appropriate for this webinar, but if a medical record is subpoenaed, do we have to provide consultation reports from other physicians or their diagnostic results? Won't they send a subpoena to them, meaning the other physician, I'm assuming, for that? That's actually a very interesting question. And um, I was listening to another seminar that um, uh, Micah had given a month or two ago and, and it talked about uh, subpoenas not being enough but also uh, that you need an authorization before you release that those records. Now if the authorization of course um, has come from the patient um, I would assume that the patient wants a complete copy of your chart including consultation reports from other physicians and that's very important to you um, of course in the hypothetical we don't know why the records are being requested but for example if it had to do with litigation um, you would want to have those other documents in your chart to show that you were following the patient aware of what else was happening what other medications what other treatment was going on and perhaps you were coordinating treatment with somebody else and of course um, patients uh, for the most part expect that so I would produce um, everything unless you think think that there's something unusual about the request that gives you pause okay thank you um, the next question and this is rather lengthy but it says I got a letter recently that said in order to avoid spoliation normal computer maintenance procedures should be suspended including defragmenting hard drives deleting internet cookies deleting browser history and favorites and running any cleanup processes. Is this reasonable? And if so, for how long? And then the person goes on to say, I'm running a business too. I thought this was a good question as well. And I looked at some of the um, comments that had to do, for example, with um, that Rule 37G I mentioned. And the courts are aware that you have to run a business. 
the courts are aware that if, um, for example, a demand is made on you to preserve evidence, it should be reasonable and narrowly tailored so as not to interfere with the most important thing that you do uh, in your daily work life, which is take care of patients. So I think um, you don't have to indefinitely um, uh, you know, store everything, not delete cookies, etc. I think you need to look for a reasonable um, process by which you do it. Um, and of course, once I notice a litigation, though, at that point, everything should come to a stop. Okay. Meaning destruction or, or deletion. Right, right. Um, the next question is, my practice is in Utah. Does spoliation apply there as well? I did look at the Utah law, um, and the answer is there are cases that address spoliation uh, in Utah. Um, as in Arizona, it's not an independent tort, so you can't be sued, at least at this time. Uh, and as far as I know, I should actually put a caveat out there. I don't practice in Utah, so um, please understand this is just uh, the research that I've done. But I understand it does, employ, uh, it does uh, exist there and um, usually in the form of a party seeking a remedy for what they think was the unfair destruction of evidence. So I guess in follow, a follow-up question to that. Is there a form of spoliation in almost all states? Yeah, I, was, I looked at that too. There, there is, and um, that's true across the board for the most part. The real debate has been that there's a minority of states who um, have elevated it to an actual tort. So in other words, you can be sued for spoliation, but it's a minority. And I, I didn't research this exhaustively, but I, I suspect that that number is, if not shrinking, not growing. OK. All right. Um, the next question. As an office manager, I am sometimes confused about the length of time I need to preserve or retain different records i.e. billing, video recordings, etc. I don't want to be accused of spoliation. What is your advice? Um, so in terms of the billing and medical records, I think um, you should simply follow state law. And the same would be true of video uh, recording. If, as, you should think of the sort of the touchstone of state law on the time period that you have to keep the records. If you comply with that, you are on safe ground. And then when you add to that, um, although this uh, may be unlikely except in a few outlier cases, for example, there are some cases, believe it or not, that might um, come to light, uh, you know, long after the treatment and, and even long after the statute of limitations. Um, but if you're on notice of it, then of course, um, regardless of state law, hold on to the documentation or the medical chart. Thank you to Mr. Patrick White for today. Uh, I think you did a great job in talking about preparation for trial as well as spoliation. And Patrick, again, is an attorney with uh, Kent and Whittakin. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you virtually next time. Thank you. Thank you.